Attention all horror enthusiasts, get ready to dive in into the world of Chillian 2.0. They've revamped everything to bring you an enhanced listening experience with a brand new look. The best part, Chillian is now completely free. Yeah, you heard it right. No more barriers, just pure spine-tingling enjoyment at no cost. And get ready for an expanded library of terror. Explore a vast range of new content, including full-length novels, gripping podcasts, and so much more. We've curated a collection that will keep you on the edge of your seat, craving for more. And discover exciting features like creator profiles where you can follow your favorite narrators and authors. Stay in the loop and never miss a release again. Engage in lively community discussions and connect with fellow horror lovers and exchange spine-chilling recommendations. Embrace yourself for the ultimate scare. Chilling now has video content coming your way this summer. Get ready to witness horror unfold before your eyes in a whole new dimension. So why wait? Start your free listening journey on Chilling today. Unleash the fright and immerse yourself in a world of tales that will haunt your dreams. Download the app and embark on an unforgettable horror experience. It won't harm if you're having fun. If you're laughing so hard, your eyes are tearing up, is your body telling you that you're having the best time of your life? Or are the tears signaling you should stop? In my experience, it means fun has its limits, especially if it's involuntary. I know it sounds absolutely bonkers. We spend so much time of our adult life being fed up with boredom. We want excitement. We need to feel the thrill of a new experience. A new love, a trip to an exotic country. Go into a festival where you feel connected to a stranger that you'll never see again. We love the unexpected because it pulls us out of the day-to-day -day life of work, eat, and sleep. But remember when you wish for something too much, it might just be waiting around the corner. Chasing you down to force the fun right into you. I, for one, always sought the thrill of a new adventure and oh boy did it find me. It happened when my friends and I visited a camp we never agreed to join. But soon enough we found our identity slowly being chewed off inside this bright and happy forest. It all started when we made two big mistakes during an otherwise dull and uneventful night. The first one was declining a last drink at the bar and the second one was missing the very last bus that could have taken us away. Though after everything I've been through so far, I have my doubts that getting home was ever an option. Believe me when I say that there's nothing that could compare to the psychological terror of Camp Tallytale. Can I get you another drink, sweetie? The barman had been flirting with my friend Lola all night and giving my buddy and myself free drinks as well. It almost felt like he wanted us to like him so badly that we would come back to this rusty old pub surrounded by nothing but trees. It was one of those nights where we had decided to be spontaneous and do something new and refreshing. Lola, Lars, and I had been hiking through the woods all afternoon until we found this place. Chatting with Josh, the guy behind the bar, however, was not really what I had in mind earlier. The pub was dead. The last guest had left hours ago and we probably should have followed, but we had reached that phase of a slight buzz, mixed with just enough tiredness to keep you on the same seat for hours. I think we should head out, guys. I said after checking my phone for any form of transportation back home. All right. Lola sighed and slowly got up from her seat. Oh, come on, it's not that late. One more drink won't harm ya. The last round is on the house. The barman exclaimed a little too enthusiastically. Lars shot us a hopeful look, but Lola and I shook our heads simultaneously. We'll never find an Uber around here and I'm not walking home, buddy. We said goodbye to Josh and headed towards the bus station. 
But as we got closer to the little booth, we just saw the last bus of the night take off without us. Remind me, why the heck did we decide to come here again? It was your idea, Marcus. Why don't you tell us? Lola hissed at me. I might as well just head back to the pub and wait, Lars suggested. Spending another three hours in there didn't seem like the best idea, though, and neither did walking for hours through the dark. I guess we missed our chance. Lola responded and pointed towards the pitch dark inside of the pub. How did he close up so fast? Lars asked. And wasn't there a car parked here earlier? I mean, if he left, we would have heard him or seen him. That's so weird. Lola whispered. I stayed quiet, wondering if I was drunker than I had assumed. And after standing there staring at an empty pub... With only one street lamp lighting up the area, I suggested that we walk. Josh had mentioned a town about six miles from here. It should take us about an hour or two to get to the next town. Maybe we can find another bus or at least a diner. I'm starving. Well, it sounds better than staying here. It's getting kind of creepy, Lola added. We started walking in the direction that the bus had gone. I kept searching for that town that Josh had talked about but couldn't seem to find it on Google Maps. And so we just followed the road, lighting up the street with flashlights on our phones until we would reach the next bus stop. We had gotten quiet. The booze was starting to lose its effect and the exhaustion was setting in. After walking for about half an hour, the sun was slowly starting to dawn. I was completely lost in my thoughts. My head heavy and empty when Lars suddenly pulled my arm so hard, it shook me out of my little trance. Guys, what the heck? He whispered as we took a quick stop. There was a loud rattling coming from the bushes in front of us. The rattling got louder until it turned into the sound of laughter, or possibly crying. It was hard to make sense of. Should we run? I quietly asked, but before we could react, we saw the origin of the sound. One after the other, a number of strangers emerged from the woods. As they jumped toward the street, they looked around as if they were lost. There were at least a dozen of them, all dressed in the same bright pink t-shirt. Let's go back. One of them started shouting loudly, followed by a weeping from different members of the group. Wait, are those children? Lola asked as she started moving closer towards them. Lo, what the heck? We're alone in the middle of nowhere. Maybe moving towards the creepy forest people isn't a great idea. Lars exclaimed while still following her. Maybe they're just lost, she responded. This situation was insanely peculiar though. For some reason it felt awfully familiar as well. For a few moments, I just stood there frozen until I finally snapped out of it and caught up to my friends. Those are not children, I whispered. It was only then that the group of strangers had started noticing us. One following the other, they carefully turned around and stared at us. We were only a few feet away by this point. I don't remember how long we stood there for, all quiet and worried before I heard Lola speaking. Are you okay? She carefully asked. They didn't answer. Instead, they just kept staring. We didn't escape. They'll find us. One of the strangers, a young woman with long brown hair, finally said. Her voice sounded shaky and low. They'll find us. Another man of the group whispered. Who will find you? What happened to you? Lars asked as he got a step closer towards the group. For a little while, and nobody answered. But then the woman who spoke first opened her mouth again. Please get help. My friends and I traded eye contact. This whole situation was absolutely bizarre, but this group didn't feel threatening. They seemed to be genuinely afraid of something. Before I could even ask where they came from, the entire group had turned their backs towards us and started marching down the street. 
What the actual heck? I whispered. Marcus, call the police. Maybe they got out of some hospital. When were they all wear matching shirts? Lars asked. I was afraid that I wouldn't have any signals so deep into the woods, but after a few seconds, I had a dispatcher on the line. I tried my best to explain this weird situation to the man, and I was already expecting him to hang up, thinking that we were on drugs or something, but he stayed calm and friendly. Right, bud. Thanks a bunch for calling. You did the right thing. Those people that you saw disappeared from a rehab facility. They are not dangerous, but they might seem a little lost to you. We'll send cars down now to go and pick them up. Could you do us a favor and stay in near sight of them so that we can track your location? Um, yeah, I guess. Are you sure they're not dangerous? Absolutely. And we happen to be quite close, so don't you worry. Take some safety distance and do not talk to them. Just stay close by. I'm not entirely sure how much time had passed, but it didn't feel longer than a few minutes when we heard the sound of cars behind us. A police car stopped right next to us. It was followed by one of those big yellow school buses which kept driving up the road. We had lost sight of the group. Lars thought that it would be better to stay away especially after we had tried talking to them before. This situation was massively strange after all, but from the occasional giggle that we heard, we knew that they were still close. Two officers stepped out of the car, a woman with short blonde hair and a man with a dark mustache. The man greeted us with a friendly smile and asked if we were doing all right. The woman was on the phone and it sounded like she was talking to whoever was driving the bus. All right, it sounds like they're all back in, she said towards the other officer. Splendid, he exclaimed and smiled. Thank you so much for helping us. Who knows what would have happened to them out here? What was wrong with them? Lola bluntly asked. Oh, we don't know for sure. We just got the call to look for them and you guys helped us a ton. Can we offer you a drive to town? As we were still basically in the middle of nowhere, it didn't take much discussing for us to take him up on the offer. The car drive was weird to say the least. It almost felt like they were interrogating us, asking where we were, what we were doing, and who we were, and so on. So, you went for a cheeky little drink right in the middle of the woods, huh? The woman asked. While the pub was the only place around, Lars laughed nervously. A pub in the woods. The man asked and gave his colleague a questioning look. Yeah, the one next to the closest bus stop, I guess. Small place, only a parking lot around, I said. I'm not sure what to tell you, buddy, but there surely is no pub around here. And the closest one is in town. How long did we walk for then? Lola asked us, but we both had no idea what to say. This night was getting stranger by the second, and this mess was only the beginning. Okie dokie, friends. Sounds like you're a bit confused. You look a little messy, too, don't they, Ron? The woman asked. Oh, they sure do, don't they, Wanda? Luckily, we got something special for them to change into. What is going on? I asked. I thought they were taking us to town, but now it felt like we were even deeper inside the woods. Oh, come on. You know we don't like that type of language, Marcus. Also, could you be a little sweetheart and grab the bag underneath your seat? The officer called Ron said. At first, I hesitated. Something was so off about these officers that it made me shiver. My friends were both looking at me, their faces a mixture of confusion and fear. Marcus, Ron asked you to do something. The woman said with a stern tone. I reached under my seat where I found a soft bag. Open up. The woman turned around and looked at me with excitement in her eyes. I didn't move. But Lars, who was sitting right next to me, was seemingly getting fed up. He reached inside the bag and pulled out a pile of fabric. Pink and blue. Those were t-shirts. Two pink shirts like those strangers were wearing and another blue one. Lars grabbed the blue one and held it up. 
What the heck, it says Lola on the front. We looked at the two pink shirts. One of them had the name Lars printed on it and the other Marcus. I instinctively grabbed the door handle even though we were still driving, but it was no use. It was locked. What is going on? Lars was now shouting. Where are you taking us? Lola added. The officers didn't answer. Instead, the car came to a radio stop. All of a sudden, we heard the loud sound of a siren blasting. No, it wasn't a siren. It was a bell. A look outside the car proved to us that we were nowhere near a town or civilization for that matter. We had parked right outside of a campground. We heard the clicking of the back doors unlocking. The officers walked out and I slammed the door open, ready to get running, to get away from whatever was happening. But there was no escape. About five other adults dressed in scout outfits were coming up with bats in their hands. My friends had left the car as well and we were facing the entrance of this campground with the scouts and officers surrounding us. What's happening? Lars sounded but his voice sounded numb through the ringing of the bell, which kept getting louder and louder each second. The scouts came closer. They had big, bright smiles on their faces and kept mouthing something that I couldn't understand. I was so distracted that I hadn't noticed Ron had walked up to me. His greasy, heavy hand was now resting on my shoulder, while his other hand was pointing at something high up. Lola was staring up. Her face had turned entirely pale. Lars must have looked up as well because he was throwing his guts up. I was afraid of what I would see now. The first thing that popped into my eyes was a big sign saying, Welcome to Camp Tallytale. But that wasn't the thing that made my stomach turn and my heart raise. Next to the sign was a rope from which a body was hanging. It was the body of the girl with the pink shirt and brown hair, one of the ones that had escaped from the forest. Her lifeless eyes were opened wide. Her shirt was drained in blood. Welcome back, Marcus. We missed you guys. I felt Ron's hot breath in my ear as the bell finally stopped ringing. We started the night with quiet drinks at a pub and now we were stuck in some madness that we couldn't make any sense of. They had forced us to put on the shirts. We were shouting, crying and asking what was going on but nobody answered. Instead they guided us inside the camp. There were a bunch of bungalows all looking the same. We kept passing about 10 or 12 of them after which they had separated Lola from us. We tried to fight them and she tried to fight them but it was no use. They took her away and brought Lars and me to one bungalow somewhere in the middle of the camp. Without a word, they locked us in. Of course, we tried calling for help. Lars' battery was empty but I called and texted every single person on my phone. The only reply that I got was a text from my mother saying, Have fun at camp, sweetie. Calling the police obviously wasn't an option either. I wish we had known that earlier. As much as Lars and I tried, we couldn't remember why we had gone on a hike or how exactly we had ended up in that pub. We had no idea how the police were involved in this and who else was. Of course, by now we realized that none of this had been a coincidence. I wish we had known that we had been to this camp before, that we had never truly escaped. But this day was just another beginning of Camp Tallytale, and it would get so much worse from here on. Greetings, strangers and soon-to-be friends. With an enthusiastic three times hurrah, we lovingly welcome you to Camp Tallytale. We hope that you're ready for days filled with sunshine, friendship, and most of all, fun. And when we say days, we mean as long as you can last, of course. Attached, you will find the program for the day. Soon you will be reunited with the rest of your group and the next edition of the tournaments can begin. The note was sitting on one of the beds in the bungalow where Lars and I had been locked in. We had gone through multiple phases by now consisting of shouting, smashing our bodies against the door and looking for secret escapes. We had long given up on trying to call anyone. 
Either these people had somehow exchanged my phone without me realizing, or this whole mess was even bigger than I thought. The program only said, lunch and hunt. And do you think the other people living here will come back soon? I asked Lars. There were four beds in the wooden hut. Two of them didn't have any sheets, blankets, or pillows. And the other two, however, looked as if somebody had been sleeping in them. We also found t-shirts with different names on them. Ian and Julian. Maybe their bodies are already hanging from the entrance. Lars numbly responded. The shirts were the only items that we could find, the only clues there were so far. The whole situation felt entirely surreal. We hadn't slept at all and were surely losing our grip on reality. They knew who we were. They knew it was us when we called. They had it all planned out. I mumbled more to myself than to Lars. I think we've been here before, he whispered. No, we surely have been here before. I just can't remember how and why we left and... And how the heck did we end up in that pub? I interrupted him. Lars nodded. It all seemed so logical to me last night. We had been on a hike, we found a pub and had a few drinks. Nothing too unusual, but as hard as I tried, I simply couldn't remember anything that preceded that hike. I couldn't remember where we met up, when we started leaving or what route we took at all. It felt as if a part of my memory had been wiped away. The one thing that was bugging me the most, however, was that it all seemed so normal to me yesterday. I felt like I was just waking up from a dream. What exactly do you remember? I asked. Lars stayed quiet for a while. I know we stayed in this hut before and I vaguely remember the other dudes. He pointed at the two beds on the left side of the bungalow. And that we were afraid of them. My eyes shifted towards the beds. If they were trapped here just like us, shouldn't they be on our side? Though thinking about the agitated campers we met in the morning, I don't think the people in this camp were all that normal. Or at least, not exactly conscious of their actions. Do you remember what this tournament is all about? He shook his head. But from what we saw this morning, I suggest that we play along. I don't think they like people going against. We both jumped up as we heard the sound of a knock on the door. The knocking had the same tune to it as the ringing of the bell that we heard as they hung a dead girl up at the entrance sign. The sound still sends a shiver down my spine. Hello, 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 you have absolutely no idea how much we missed you folks. The door opened and we were greeted by the freakishly white smile of a man dressed as a scout. The fabric of his uniform resembled something an action figure would wear, as if it was created out of Play-Doh and plastic. I hadn't noticed yesterday, but there was something very uncanny about it. His skin was shiny and smooth and his hair was perfectly groomed. He looked nothing like somebody working at a camp. More like he was created in a laboratory. My name's Jeremiah. You knew that before, but you don't anymore. Lars and I exchanged eye contact. I knew we were both thinking about storming the guy and trying to run, but neither of us made a move. Those people were not scared of us, which made it even more obvious to me that we should be scared of them. The smile of the man turned into a frown. Oh gosh darn it boys, you're not wearing your shirts. How will the other campers know you belong to them? He kept staring at us, not blinking at all for what felt like minutes. The smile became more forced by the second and we could see the sweat forming on his forehead. His head slightly shifted and his gaze was pointed towards these shirts that they had thrown in the cabin when they had locked us in. The atmosphere was so tense and massively messed up. We couldn't take it for long until we took off our shirts and put on the pink camp shirts with our names on them. Oh, now don't you look marvelous. Now hand me those nasty old fabrics and let us go have some lunch, shall we? He ripped our shirts out of our hands and gestured for us to follow him. 
Should we make a run for it? I whispered towards Lars while we slowly followed Jeremiah out the door. He shook his head. Maybe he'll bring us to Lola. We passed a couple of identical bungalows and even spotted a couple of other campers. It seemed as if everybody staying near us belonged to the same pink group, as those were the only shirts that we saw. The other campers avoided any form of eye contact. Lars even tried calling out to some but were blatantly ignored. We saw them in little groups, never alone. Some were playing card games, some were chatting or laughing. If it hadn't been for everything that had happened this morning, this might have seemed like a regular camp. And we kept following Jeremiah until we reached what I assumed was the dining hall. Our hopes of meeting Lola again vanished as we were greeted by the masses of pink. Where are all the other campers? I asked. Oh, we only eat with our kind boys. Do not dare to mingle with those other creatures or you might regret it. Jeremiah said as he looked deep in my eyes. His picture-perfect face was showing creases in the skin, and I thought he might explode any second until he started laughing hysterically. I mean, I don't mind who you mingle with, but the other campers will straight up murder you and feast on your flesh. Alrighty now, go have a seat over there with your bunk buddies. They surely missed you. He grabbed my shoulder tightly and pointed us towards two guys sitting alone on a table. One of them had dark hair and a short beard. He looked a bit older than us, maybe in his late 20s or 30s. As we got closer, I saw the name on his shirt, Julian. The other guy, Ian, was slightly younger with light hair and a mean scar on his face. Ian and I made eye contact for what must have been a second, but it was enough to understand what Lars spoke about earlier. We definitely had met before, even if I didn't remember these specifics. Sometimes your brain and body can't communicate in a way that you understand. It's almost as if there's a barrier somewhere inside you. Maybe it's the two brain halves and not being able to connect properly. But at that moment, my heart had started racing and my hands were shaking. My body was reacting with anxiety at the look of Ian. If only I knew why. As he spotted us, I swear his mouth formed into a smile for a split second, which quickly turned into a look of pure hate. Lars sat down in front of them and I reluctantly followed. Guess you're back, the guy named Julian said in a dry tone. He looked neither happy nor surprised. Of course they're back, but not for long if we can help it, Ian said with a grin on his face. What's your problem, man? Aren't you trapped in here just like us? Lars smashed his fists against the wooden table. I could feel his rage build up. Boys, 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 be nicer. We'll have to throw you in the fighting cage. <laughs> this is no team behavior. Look what you did to poor Ian last time. Jeremiah had appeared out of nowhere again. Except this time he at least had some food for us. Even if it wasn't exactly appetizing. He put down two trays with uh, some slimy substance that looked like porridge mixed with dirt and a bottle of water. I know, I know, it doesn't look too promising, but just smell it. Fresh cinnamon always makes my heart feel full. Jeremiah whispered in my ear. And now, shush, shush, and enjoy. He gently stroked my head and then took off again. Lars didn't even hesitate as he started shoving the weird substance into his mouth. It's not that bad, he mumbled. My stomach was rumbling like crazy. I couldn't remember the last time that I ate anything at all. I hadn't consumed anything since the beer at the bar. Jeremiah was right. It did smell like cinnamon, but it wasn't a nice scent. It made me feel sick. Just eat it. You need to get your strength back, Lars whispered. I shook my head. Ian, who had closely watched us, got a small sachet out of his pocket. He looked around to see if anybody was watching and then started pouring it on my porridge. I can't stomach the cinnamon either. This helps. I figured that it was salt. 
Ian didn't look like the kind of guy who would help me, but even if it was salt or anything else, I doubted that it would make this slime taste even worse. And so I took a big spoonful and shoved the dirt porridge down my throat. Look, can we just be honest here? Neither I nor Lars remember anything about this camp. We have no idea what's going on and we're crapping ourselves. Our friend was brought to the other group. Marcus! Lars shouted and hit his fist on my thigh, signaling for me to be quiet. He didn't push that hard, but for some reason, I felt an excruciating pain go through my entire body. I had difficulties to even keep my breath steady. We can't give you any information on that. All we know is that we live here now and that running away will get you killed. Staying might get you killed as well. Look around. Every single person in this room wants to see you dead. And the ones from the other team even more so, Julian said. We were obviously here before and they caught us again. Why didn't they kill us? Lars asked. Because you didn't escape. They let you go. And you were the ones dumb enough to come back, Ian hissed. And on top of that, you ruined things for us as well. Oh, I started speaking but I couldn't finish my sentence. It felt like something was tearing me up from the inside. Whoa, Marcus, your face is turned to white as paper. Are you okay? I shook my head. Whatever Ian had given me was about to make its way back up my throat. Ian laughed and pointed towards the corner of the room with a bathroom sign. I got up as fast as I could and ran inside the first stall. And I was just in time. The vomit was shooting out of my mouth. I threw up my guts until there was absolutely nothing left in my stomach. Porridge was followed by spit, yellow bile, and finally, something green and bitter which I assume was even more bile. My stomach was cramping up and my entire body was in pain. My breathing became faster and tears were dripping from my eyes. Everything had gone to absolute crap in a matter of a couple of hours. As I sat there at the bottom of the bathroom stall, close to giving up, I heard Lara's voice from the outside. Marcus? Screw that guy, I cried. He tried poisoning me. Lars opened the door to the stall and sat down beside me. Yeah, I don't think we should trust any of the people here, I nodded. He handed me the bottle of water and my stomach slowly calmed down. At least there was nothing left inside that could come out. I was collecting my strength to finally get up again and confront Ian when Lars pointed at a dark stain on my thigh. Is that blood? He asked. It was the spot where he had hit me with his fist before. There was no way that he could have hit that hard. I pulled down my pants and was more than surprised to see blood all over my leg surrounding a big cut. I gently touched it with my fingers and noticed that it wasn't just one cut. There was something carved into my thigh. That's a word. Lars got up to pour some water on a piece of toilet paper and handed it to me. I cleaned off the blood and realized that Lars was right. It seemed that I had left a message on my own body. Kill Ian. I knew we couldn't trust that guy and now we have proof. He just poisoned you. He said everybody wants us dead and that includes him. We can't trust him or that Julian guy. Or anyone for that matter. We need to. The door to the bathroom opened with a sudden bang and I quickly pulled my pants back up. It was Jeremiah. I swear that I'll see his uncanny face in my nightmares until the day that I die. Boys, you're making me go all woozy. Gosh, it's no time for a bathroom break. We're about to start our first round. Against the blue campers. I had completely lost my sense of time. I thought it was some time around the afternoon, but by the time that we left the dining hall, it was pitch black outside. The only thing keeping me slightly sane was having Lars here with me. I couldn't imagine how Lola was feeling right now. However, they were about to take that last straw away from me as well. We were supposed to complete this round in teams of two and of course, I was teamed up with Ian. Nobody told us a thing about what was about to happen. After teaming us up, they tied up our hands behind our back and blindfolded us. Somebody took my hand and we started walking. I had no idea where we were going or who the person taking me was. 
though I had guessed it was Jeremiah. From the sounds of breaking sticks on the ground, I assumed we were going through the forest. Finally, we stopped and I heard some rumbling next to me. You wait exactly five minutes and then you and I am, understood. I heard an unfamiliar voice say, followed by the sound of them walking away. What's going on? I cried but received no answer. After it felt like an eternity, my hands were freed. I ripped the blindfold off my face and was immediately struck by a silver light burning right into my eyes. I took a step back and started blinking a few times until I could finally make sense of what was in front of me. It was Ian holding a torch. In his hands were a sharp knife and a piece of paper. We need to hunt down this chick. He said nonchalantly as if he hadn't just almost destroyed my vision. He passed me the piece of paper which had a photo printed on it. My vision was still blurry but between the dots of green and blue. I recognized the girl on the photo. It was Lola. My friend Lola who was separated from us and brought to the blue camp. What do you mean hunt her down? He held up the knife. Like make the bell ring, he said. I stayed quiet. Ian was not to be trusted and telling him that Lola was my friend was probably fuel for his anger even more. I had to think quickly. Kill Ian, kill Ian, kill Ian. That was all that was running through my mind. If we didn't get him first, he'll try and get rid of us. He wants to hunt Lola. He wants us dead. Everybody here wants us dead. The lack of sleep and food was destroying my mind and all I knew was that I had to survive and get my friends out of here. With a sudden movement, I jumped him from behind and managed to get a hold of the knife. Don't move! I shouted and held the knife right up to his throat. What the heck are you doing? He whispered. I'm gonna get rid of you before you can do the same to us. His eyes turned sad instead of scared. You're letting this all get to your head. Breathe, he whispered. Oh, don't try to play mind games with me, Ian. I know dang well what you're up to. Slowly, Ian moved his right hand up and touched the back of mine. I was praying that he didn't feel how terribly I was shaking. I had gotten myself into a really dangerous situation, and he looked stronger than me. If he had grabbed the knife, I'd be gone. I tightened my grip, but Ian didn't even try to go for the knife. Very slowly, he took a tiny step back, just enough so that the cold knife wouldn't be resting right against his throat. And then he got really close to my ear and whispered something inside them. I'm not Ian and you're not Marcus. Your name is Killian and your friends want to murder you. I used to be a trusting person. I believed in my family and my friends and in the authorities. I'm from a small place with hardly any violence besides a number of unfortunate events of years back. Something had fundamentally changed about me, however. I had completely forgotten who I was. No, that isn't entirely true. I did remember my childhood. I remembered my mom and my sister in the town that we grew up in. Thinking about my past, I didn't remember Lola or Lars. When we sat in the pub or as we walked through the forest, I had this sense of familiarity. As if they had been my friends for years, but I only met these two here at camp. The letters on my thigh weren't instructing me to kill Ian. They were a reminder of a name. And tearing this name out of the mouth of this man with a scar on his face finally woke up another memory. He wasn't entirely right. My name wasn't Killian. I mean, my actual birth given name. There were very few people that would call me that name, however. The ones that I had met the last time I was fearing for my life. At least at first. You can't go through life being scared all the time. Eventually, you need to decide for yourself who you want to trust and believe in. We are born alone, but we go through life in groups. We are social animals and we need each other to survive. Even though I haven't known this guy for a long time and even though he has gotten me in some major messed up situations before, I here and there decided that I would trust him. Because I knew him. I knew exactly who he was and you can't say that about many people. 
and the reaction in my body after seeing him wasn't fear. Alex? I whispered. He turned off the light of the torch. If we're hunting one of them, they're hunting us, was his only response. My memory of the events before getting to camp was becoming clearer by the second, meeting Alex and his friends, getting so close to him, but something was not right. Why was my memory cut off right after those events? Are these people connected to Worley? I asked. Alex grabbed me by the shoulder a little too tight. Stop asking questions, we need to hunt down this girl. He had left me with more questions than answers, but by his intense reaction, I could tell that I really needed to be quiet. It was tearing me up. Being in a situation where you can't even trust your own senses or memory was slowly turning me insane. I had almost cut through the throat of Alex. Who knows what had happened to me in this camp and what my unconscious mind was capable of. We moved through the dark for a little while until Alex had turned the torch back on. What will happen to her if we find her? I asked. The silence was killing me. You can't shut up for two seconds, can you? We'll bring her to the bonfire before they take one of us, or at least that's what I hope. Every round we play here has a different meaning. You never quite know for sure what they want you to do. Or, well, you did once. That's how they let you go. But then they brought me back here. He shrugged. That must be on you. Guess you deserved it. This Alex was nothing like the one that I knew before. He was harsh and rude. I still had no idea why he made me throw up my guts in the morning. Thinking about that event made my stomach cramp up again. I was starving and slowly losing my strength. But then the bell came. Crap, Alex shouted. All of a sudden, not concerned about being quiet anymore. It's over, he continued. So we lost. I hope not. But we better hope that friend of yours didn't get any of our people. Lola? I laughed. She's like the most peaceful person I know. Alex turned dead serious, which looked even scarier in the dimly lit forest. You don't know her, Killian. She's ruthless. Why do you think she was freed with you? She has the highest kill number in here. I wanted to ask him if that was the same reason I was freed, but the words wouldn't come out of my mouth. We had walked through the forest and were close to the entrance of Camp Tallytale. I was relieved to see that the body of the girl wasn't hanging from the sign anymore. Alex was about to walk inside, but I took a step back. Those in there weren't my friends, and even if they were, I couldn't help them in there, but I could run. There was nobody around and the forest was dark. If I just got far enough, I had to find people who were still sane. A real police officer. As if Alex was reading my mind, he grabbed my hand. If you go now, you're dead. Reluctantly, I followed him inside the camp. We heard distant noises coming from somewhere inside. Music and people cheering. It almost sounded like a party. I made it out once before, but even if I played their games and won again, who says I wouldn't simply repeat all of this madness again? We reached an area with a big bonfire lit up. There were campers of both teams gathered around, pink shirts on the left and blue shirts on the right. Just around the fire stood two members of our team. Only as we got closer, I started realizing that they were Lars and Julianne. I tried to run towards them, but Alex held me back. Campers, it's time. The voice of Jeremiah rang through the whole camp. I couldn't see him anywhere around. His voice was coming out of a speaker system. Tonight, one brave member of our camp will walk over the threshold to the other side. What other side? I whispered. Death. The blue superiors have collected the two chosen ones. Whoever stays with us and who goes will be decided by the flames. You may use your body and knives. May the best one die. The voice was followed by loud laughter. Lars and Julian didn't even hesitate a second before they started attacking each other. Lars started by going for Julian's guts, but he turned away just in time. 
only getting cut into his arm, and then he pushed Lars to the ground right next to the fire. He stomped his foot on his chest and started screaming something inaudibly. What are we doing? We need to help, I shouted. Don't worry, he's got this, Alex responded, though I had no idea who he was talking about. In the meantime, Lars had freed himself and was holding the face of Julian right over the flames. The laughter through the speakers had become even louder. I thought that this was the end. Julian's face must have been burning by this point, but with a sudden movement, he pushed his knife inside the stomach of Lars. They almost collapsed into the flames together, but Julian managed to turn around, letting my friend fall into the fire. His screams of pain were the only sound overshadowing the laughter. Some campers were cheering, but only for a few seconds, and then they turned around and walked away as if none of this had just happened. My heart was racing. Lars, my friend Lars. I started listening to Alex and believed whatever he told me, not realizing that again I was putting my faith in the hands of someone else. I had to stop believing other people and start doing what I thought was right. With the knife that was still in my hand, I aimed for the face of Alex, who was holding me by the sleeve. He let go of me and I started running, hoping that I could still save Lars or at least throw Julian in there with him, but I messed up. I slipped and fell to the ground. When I tried to get back up, I was staring right into the bloody face of Alex. The last thing that I saw was his fist going for my face. And then everything turned dark. I don't trust him, man. We're better off if we drop him somewhere. His mind is corrupted. I was slowly coming back to my senses. I had no idea where I was and I couldn't open my eyes. Or I could, but everything was dark. My first thought was that I had gone blind. Slowly the memories of what had happened came back to me. Had Alex hit my eyes so hard that I couldn't see anymore. I tried to touch my face, but my hands were tied up. He didn't eat anything while he was there. I just give him some time. I trust him. That was Alex. You shouldn't have let the other one die, Manuel. This time I heard a woman speak, but it wasn't Lola or the officer. I didn't recognize her voice. You know well it was the only way to get out. We won. I started breathing heavily. Sitting here in complete darkness, not knowing what would happen to me next, was eating me up alive. In front of me, I saw the face of Lars and I heard his screams. I saw the girl hanging from the sign that read Camp Tallytell and imagined the same happening to Lola. And then I saw Alex, but not the same way that I saw him in camp. I saw us together during all those occasions in the past where I was certain that I would die. I saw his kind smile and the braveness in his eyes. Somebody was walking over to me. They touched my face and removed what I assumed was a blindfold. I hadn't gone blind after all. It was Alex and he tried to smile but I could see the pain in his eyes. I looked around and realized that I was back at the pub. Where's Josh? I mumbled. At a meeting in town, the woman responded. She looked young, around my age maybe. The only other person in the room was Julianne. Who did she talk to when she just said Emmanuel? I looked over at Julianne. Who are you people? We're friends of Josh, the barman who tried to save you, he responded. I turned towards Alex. Can you untie me please? He shook his head. Sorry, can't trust you yet. You were at the camp for quite a while and I believe your thoughts aren't completely yours again. The girl walked up with something that looked like a smoothie. Start by eating regular food again. Don't worry, it's safe. Every day that you spent at camp, they were chewing on your brain. They were doing experiments on everybody in there. Testing their mind and will. Testing how much it would take for them to start hurting each other if they put them in different camps and called the others their enemies. It's been going on for months now. The girl that you know as Lola killed a bunch of innocent people, as did Lars. And who are you? I asked. I'm one of them, in theory, as is Josh. But we're not trying to hurt anyone, we want to help you. 
That's why we had Manuel over here infiltrating the camp. He was supposed to win this round and get you back out. This time, we'll make sure that you stay out. Alex was now holding my tied up hand. I have no idea how we ended up here, Killian. It took me a while of starving myself to figure things out until I finally met Manuel. So, these are the worthy people. He shook his head. Yes and no, it's much bigger than just that. They are all somehow connected and now they've caught us. The only silver lining is that, as far as we know, our other friends aren't in here. I started understanding what they meant by my corrupted mind. I felt trust for Alex and even for these strangers, but at the same time, there is a part of me feeling intense rage. I wanted to burn this entire pub down, and every time I closed my eyes, it felt like Cam Tallytale was calling me to come back. I kept hearing Jeremiah's laugh and deep inside I was still thinking about Lola. I didn't know her at all. She wasn't my friend but a part of my brain was sure she was. I was close to a panic attack. Does this at least mean that we can get the heck out now and get some actual help? I cried out. No Killian. We left Camp Tallytail but we're not out yet. We're still inside the forest. There's no escape. Or at least we haven't found one so far. For now, we need to focus on you getting your mind back and then we can discuss the next steps.